glory, glory, yeah. The blood of Jesus. We love you, Lord. We thank you and praise you for your blood that has washed us clean and, and covered our sin and has atoned for our, for our transgressions. And we thank you for that wonderful, wonderful word that you've given us, the sacrifice you've given us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Yeah, I'm telling you, the blood of Jesus shed for us gives us, big theological word, atonement. Uh, at one meant is what atonement means. It means because of Jesus, not because of my goodness, not because I earned it, I deserved it, I got my merit badge for Sunday school, whatever it might be. No, G, the blood of Jesus makes us at one with God. It's only, it's only the, the blood of the innocent shed for the guilty that can, uh, that can cover sin. So there you go. It always has been that way. I want to share with you today um, about an event that happens before the final seven years of human history on this earth. Now, the human history in the final seven years is going to be interfered with by satanic influences and forces. Uh, just so you might know, because I know a lot of times people don't even hear the name of, of Satan in the tribulation period, those last seven tr terrible tribulation, worst days on earth years. Uh, there, just like there is a God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, there is a satanic trinity, and it is the satanic trinity that functions on this earth during the final seven years of tribulation. The, the anti-God is called the dragon. The anti-Christ is called, obviously, the antichrist, or sometimes called the beast. Two different names for him, same person. And then the anti-Holy Spirit is called the false prophet. And they work during the tribulation period to deceive and destroy and perpetrate uh, all manner of evil on this earth in every possible way. So I believe before that period happens on this earth that God is going to rapture or snatch away, pull out his church, which uh, are, are the Christians. And in this message, I'd like to ask four questions. One is, what is the rapture of the church? Second, why is a rapture necessary? Third, do children go in the rapture? And fourth, when is the rapture going to happen? And I know you're extremely interested in that, and I'm not talking about, I mean, I'd be foolish to sit up here and say, okay, well, it's going to happen in a few weeks. Uh, I have no idea. I just want to set that disclaimer straight. I don't know when the Lord's coming back. None of us do. Uh, Jesus said that none of us know the day or the hour in which the Son of Man will come. Now, it didn't say we won't know the season, and I think that now the Holy Spirit is making known to all of those that are listening to him the season, that we are either in the season or we're not in the season when this event can happen because it's not just going to completely catch us by surprise, and I'll show you some of that. All right, here we go. Right off the bat, what is the rapture of the church? The clearest explanation of the rapture is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And here's what, here's what Paul says in Thessalonians about the rapture. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. That's the biblical way of talking about people that have died. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So those that have been saved and those whose spirits are already in heaven. The Apostle Paul told us to be, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's no such thing as soul, sleep, purgatory, or any of those other crazy notions that people have in their mind. The Bible tells us what's real, and everything else is imaginary, and there's a bunch of imaginary stuff out there about end time things. Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now that's really very clear, isn't it? What actually happens. That one of these days there's gonna be a shout of the archangel, there's gonna be the trumpet of God, and all of a sudden, the bodies of those who have died and their spirits are already in heaven, who, who, who are there with Jesus as he's in the, in the, in the clouds, that their bodies are gonna be recollected. And you say, why? Well, when I start talking to you about what heaven it really is next week, and I start talking to you about what your body's gonna look like, what it's gonna be like, what it's gonna look like, you'll see why. But where, whatever might have happened to your body, it doesn't matter whether you've been cremated or you've been put in the ground, you've gone back to the dust, uh, uh, the wolves ate you, the sharks fed off of you, uh, people spread your ashes over a golf course. I mean, whatever it might be, your body is going to be immediately recollected by Jesus and, and it's going to go. And when, and when they, those bodies get where we are, then we're all going to travel together at the same time. And it's going to happen so fast. I'll show you that in just a minute. But, 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 and then we're going to go back to heaven and we're going to ever be with the Lord. We're not ever going to be separated from him again, not ever again. And so he says, so you can feel comfortable about that and comfort each other and talk to each other about that. Shall be caught up is the word, is a word uh, harpazo, which means in the Greek to snatch away or to gather up. Uh, in the Latin, this is kind of interesting, if you had a Latin Bible, the word rapture would actually be in your Bible. It's the, it's the Latin word rapturo, and it means the same thing as harpazo. It means to snatch away. Like if I walked in this door and I came in here and I, got, I grabbed one of you and I ran out the door, that would be harpazo or, or rapturo. That's what happens. That's what it's all about. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 through 53 says this. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that means we don't all die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. In, in, he says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the, the word for moment is atomos, from which we obviously get our word atomic. And so what this word means is that this amount of time that it takes for this to happen is is an indivisible amount of time. It is, a, it, it, is, it is the shortest amount of time possible. As a matter of fact, it is so short a period of time that it cannot even be measured. And all of this is gonna happen in this twinkling, this shortest time that can't even be measured in this world. So I've had people ask me before, well, pastor, what if I'm in the shower when the rapture happens? And I'm saying, I hope you've been working out. <laughs> you <know? laughs> if you hadn't, it's going to kind of be embarrassing. <laughs> you're going through the sky naked up there and, uh, <laughs> and, and looking like that. But anyway, so that, I'd encourage all of us, hey, I'm going to start working out, all right? All right, now here's Jesus himself describing the rapture. We've read what Paul says about it. Now, all right, let's, thank you, brother. You, you saw it in my eyes, didn't you? Um, Here's what Jesus himself says about it. This is Luke 17. For as lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. Now let me just show you what. He's talking about lightning that flashes here and it doesn't come to the earth. It just flashes across the sky. And this lightning flashes across the side. So what he's saying is, Jesus is saying, this coming of the Son of Man is going to be an event that happens in the sky. It's not coming to earth. It's going to happen right up there, just like lightning that flashes, those heat flashes across the sky. All right, so this is about the rapture, and it happens privately in the sky, verse 25. But first... He must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Oh, that's happening for sure. It always has. 
And as it was, now look at this, because now he is comparing the day of his coming, he's linking the day of his coming to being days just like the days of Noah and just like the days of Lot. Listen to what Jesus says. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day, notice it's a, a particular day now, the day it says. This is not a season of life, this is not a broad uh, spectrum of time. It happens in a day. There is a day that this is gonna happen on until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planned, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now, Jesus goes on to say, in that day, at that time, specific day, whatever day that might be, in that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back, remember Lot's wife, who turned into the pillar of salt, remember that. I mean, you, you guys know about that. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two people in bed, and one will be taken. And, and that word, by the way, is paralambano, which means to uh, receive uh, unto yourself. That's what Jesus says. One will be, one, Jesus says, one, I'm gonna, paralambano, I'm gonna receive unto myself, and the other one's gonna be left. And then he says, uh, Let's see here. Uh, two women will be grinding, at the, grinding together at the mill and one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field and one will be paralambano, one will be taken and the other left. So what happens here is a very selective thing. This is a selective resurrection. This is a selective rapture. Jesus knows who belongs to him. And the ones who belong to him are going to be taken and the ones who don't belong to him are going to be left behind. So it doesn't matter who you're standing by. It doesn't matter who you're living with. It doesn't matter who you're kin to or, or where you, you place your, your politics or anything else. What matters is, do you have a relationship with Christ? Does he know you? Do you belong to him? Because if you don't, you get left behind. If you do, he knows you and he's going to select you and you're going home with him. Verse, 30, uh, verse 37. And they answered and said to him, now this is his disciples. His disciples look at him and says, where, where, are, you going, where are they going to be taken, Lord? That's what he's really saying. Where are they going to be taken? And Jesus said, well, they're going to be taken up in the, up in the sky where the eagles fly. That's where they're going. So this is directly talking about the rapture and it's talking about an event that happens not on the earth but in the clouds, in the sky. And Jesus links his return to, the, to that day that Noah got on the boat and the flood came and the day that Lot went out of the city and then fire and brimstone uh, rained down on, on them. And he uses a word uh, uh, that he does for us, paralambano. Now this is an interesting little connection here because it's really, it just shows you how... Uh, how connected the word of God really is in every way. Jesus talks to his disciples and us through his disciples and through the word about his going away. And he's trying to comfort them. He, he's, he's just told them that he's going away, but he's not gonna leave them comfortless. He's gonna send the Holy Spirit back and the Holy Spirit's gonna work in their life. And then this is what he says in John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, peril and bono, same word, that where I am, there you might be also. Now, this is beautiful wedding language for the Jewish people. When, the, when, the, when Jesus said this to the Jewish disciples, the Jewish disciples understood immediately what Jesus was talking about. He was talking about a wedding. He said, you know, like they do in weddings. 
The way, the way Jewish people do in weddings is uh, the, the groom goes to look for a bride. And when he finds her, he goes into the father and he negotiates with the father for the dowry of the bride or whatever arrangements have to be made. And if dad says okay and the girl says okay, then the groom goes back to his father's house to begin building a place for them to live in. Well, because the son has never been married and, doesn't, and never had a family and doesn't know anything about what needs to be in the house, he obviously gets with dad and says, Dad, you know, help me with this. I, tell me what I need to put here and how big and all that kind of stuff. And so the construction then, uh, the inspection of everything turns over to dad, the father. And so the son can't just go out there and throw up a couple of two by fours and run back and get his bride. He has to wait until the father inspects everything and says, okay, this meets the inspection, and then the father gives the son permission to go back and, and get the bride. And so when he goes back and gets her, usually at night, by the way, there's an excitement about stealing her away. I need to preach that message when the bridegroom comes. That's a great word. But So he gets her, and he brings her back home, and that's where they live forever. So let me ask you a question. Where is Jesus right now? Right now, Jesus says he's in heaven building us a mansion, right? So if the average, Jew, uh, if the average Jewish male took a year to build a place for his, he and his bride, and Jesus has been gone 2,000 years, <laughs> what kind of mansion? I'm just thinking, come on, Lord. What kind of mansion could we, be, could we be having? Now, there is theology in this world, and I'm just telling you this, not because I think you would be, I don't even know if you'd ever be confronted with it, but just in case you've ever heard it or you ever get confronted with somebody who says, well, I believe in the rapture. I believe that Jesus comes and gets us, just like he said, in the clouds and so forth. Well, it'd be pretty hard to deny, to deny that, really, you know, with these verses we've read, and they're, and they're more than that. But I believe in the rapture, but I believe that we're going to have to go through either some or all of the tribulation period before we get raptured. And that we're actually, it's, it, we're going to get raptured, and, and we're going to marry Jesus in heaven, and it's going to be all good, but it all happens at the end of tribulation or in the middle of tribulation, that Jesus is gonna make us, so to speak, go through the worst seven years of torment, of torment, torture, and evil that this world has ever seen. Now, I just want you to remember that Noah didn't have to go through it. Lot didn't have to go through it. And, and Jesus describes the time of his coming as a time when life was going to be going on as usual. People were going to be marrying and giving in marriage. People were going to be running their business, going to the movie theater. Life was going to be going on. They were going to be planning and building and marrying and working. And I mean, everything was just going to be normal until all of a sudden, boom, one day in the twinkling of an eye, something dynamic happens. Well, it's ridiculous to think, and it's completely misunderstanding Scripture to think that somehow you're going to be able to be in the middle of tribulation or at the end of tribulation where two-thirds of the people that are on this earth die so you got bodies and blood and stink and stale floating around. You have comets falling out of heaven. You got the water turning to blood. You got, you got rivers, you got gnats, you got all kinds of violent things going on. You've got, uh, you, you've got rivers that are polluted and the oceans that are polluted. I mean, the earth has been ravished. And you think that after that, you're gonna be able to walk out there and say, well, this is a beautiful day for a wedding. Let's just have one. And that little smoldering pile of rock down there is the church that used to be down there, but you can't. No, no, it's obviously ridiculous to think that that's the kind of thing that's going to happen. That, as, that doesn't even make natural sense, does it? I mean, let, all right, let me just show you. All right, you ladies that are here. All right, let's say you meet someone. You're not married. You meet someone. He's handsome, debonair, suave. He's cool and everything. Everything about him is great. And you guys date for a while and you fall in love. And then he comes to you and he says, you know, 
we've been dating for a while and I really, I really love you and, and I want to marry you. I want you to be my wife. I want us to live together forever. And then she'll say, well, so do I. And he said, well, okay, but, but listen, before, before we actually get married, I just have one little stipulation for you. All right. The stipulation is I'm going to get, I'm going to give you to the most evil, wicked, pervert this world has ever seen. And he's probably going to abuse you and hurt you and kill you. But that's, but it's all right. It's all going to be good because that'll just make you appreciate me more because you'll be able to compare him to me. And, 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 and okay, that's my deal. W will you marry me? Oh, how, who, how many would take that offer up? <laughs> Absolutely not. All right, so, so there are people that are going to go through the period of tribulation and there are people that are going to be saved, come to the Lord during the period of, treble, uh, of, of uh, tribulation. But, that, but those people that do that are going to come there as martyrs. They, uh, they know that as soon as they receive Christ, that it's the end for them. And, 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 and Jesus has just described to us what the world was going to be before he came, and this is the first rapture. And I, I know when I say that, you mean, you're saying, you mean there's another one? Yeah, there, there are actually two raptures. Have you ever heard that before, by the way? Just so I'm in new, new ground right here? Well, you know, the, the first one is this one that happens before tribulation, which is just around, I mean, we, we, this, is where, this is where our season is. Next thing's gonna happen is this. And, but there's a second rapture that happens at the end of the tribulation period. It happens when Jesus comes down and steps on the Mount of Olives and, and, and the Mount of Olives splits and he rescues Israel from sure annihilation from all the armies of the earth and he redeems them. When they see that, they, they recognize him and they come to him and, they, and, and all of the martyrs that have died during tribulation, there are preachers preaching, 144,000 of them, 12,000 from each, tribe, each of the 12 tribes of Israel. There are two... Uh, prophets that come back. Most people think it's Enoch and Elijah because they didn't die. They just went to heaven. Uh, are going to come back. They're going to be doing all kinds of signs and wonders and influencing and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, there, there's going to be a lot of gospel activity going on during the tribulation. But if you get in it, you're going to die. Is what I'm going to say. He's going to cut your head off, burn you at the stake. I mean, it ain't going to be pretty whatsoever. So there's a resurrection at the end for those that were saved during the tribulation period and those that, I mean, just like that. It happens when Jesus comes and sets his feet down, commonly known as the second coming. A lot of people talk about the second, they talk about the rapture and they use the word second coming. And that's why sometimes it gets a little confusing because the rapture is not the second coming. The rapture happens in the clouds. Jesus doesn't touch the ground. His feet don't touch the ground. When he comes back to rescue Israel at the Battle of Armageddon, that's when his feet touches the ground. That's the second coming. All right, yeah, so we just get, get that all together. All right, so uh, now let me read to you about the second rapture. And I want you to see the difference, all right? Now, this is, this is Jesus talking about the second rapture, and it's in Matthew 24. And listen to this description now of what that rapture is gonna be like. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, that gives you a hint right there, right? <laughs> right? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. That's not like the days of Noah. That, that would be noticeable, I think, don't you? And the moon will not give its light. Well, that's not like the days of Noah. I mean, that business couldn't go on as usual with that going on. Uh, the stars will fall from heaven. Well, that'd be inconvenient. And the powers of the heaven will be shaken. That'll be frightening. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes... Tribes are Simeon, Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, Dan, Issachar, Manasseh, Zebulun, Asher, Reuben. That, those are the tribes. Whenever they see this, the tribes and all the tribes of the earth will mourn 
They will go, oh, how could we have missed it? How stupid are we? And they'll begin to repent, and they'll begin to say, where did you get those wounds? And Jesus will say, in the house of my friends. And they'll go, oh, and they'll just, I mean, this is what happens at the second rapture, not the first. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds. Who are his elect? (laughs) Them. From one end of heaven to the other. So you're going to get, if you go through tribulation and you come to Christ, you're you're, going to get a rapture. The only difference is you're going to have to go through a hell before you get it. That's what it very much boils down. So the good thing is to, is to is come to Jesus now. And, and, and the tribulation Christians suffer through seven years of the most horrible, terrible death in the world. And then they get raptured, but it's at the end of the tribulation. And if you want to read all about it, read Revelation chapter 7. It answers your questions. It's very interesting. Just read the whole chapter. It's about, it's about the, the rapture, the second coming of Christ. All right, second question. Why is a rapture necessary? There are two reasons why a rapture is necessary. Number one is to unite us to be with Jesus. We are the bride of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. When we, when we get to heaven, we're going to marry Jesus. And guys, we, you'll, we'll just have to get over that analogy. We're going to marry Jesus and become his wife, his heavenly wife. And we're going to live with him forever at, the marriage, at an event called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. And that's what's going to be going on in heaven for seven years while all this tribulation is going on on earth. For us that go with Jesus, we're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. By the way, you can eat anything you want and all you want, never get full, never get tired, never get fat. Holy Ghost. Then, and, 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 and that's the first reason. The second reason is to deliver us from the wrath that is coming on this earth. Now, I want to show you this. Revelation chapter 6. Look at these verses, 15 and 16, 17. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us. And hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? You know what tribulation's about? Tribulation is about wrath. It's the wrath of God poured out on this evil, wicked world. It is the judge, tribulation is the judgment of God finally falling on all the wickedness and all the evil in this world. I'll guarantee you with all the evil we've watched in the last few years, provable, verifiable, documented, evil, broad, law-breaking, just totally wide open, yet not even, not, not a, an indictment, not even an investigation. That's evil. That's lawlessness. Well, the tribulation is going to end that because it's all going to be open there and all the evil of the world and every injustice. That's what makes me so angry nowadays. Injustice. It's just not any justice. Little low-level innocent people get put in prison and these big dangerous crooks and criminals and thugs and crime families go unfettered. Well, it ain't going to happen in the tribulation. It's going to be lights out. And, and they're going to get their come up. And So we're going to be in heaven, and we're going to be enjoying the marriage supper of the Lamb, and, and people on earth are going through seven years of tribulations. Now, so, so you should know this. You're going to be experiencing Jesus in, in this period of time. You're going to be experiencing him one way or the other. You're going to spend seven years experiencing Jesus one way or the other, 
either on earth as he pours out his wrath on earth or in heaven around the throne of God where there's just such an incredible love at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So you're gonna be experiencing one of those or the other and that's the choice we make when we choose to receive Christ. First Thessalonians chapter one, look at this. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, this is Apostle Paul, and how you turn, from God, uh, turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who, what does he do? Delivers us from the wrath to come. It doesn't say he delivers us through the wrath. He delivers us from the wrath to come. Why would Jesus take us to heaven before all this horrible stuff starts happening in tribulation? Because it's nothing but wrath. And Jesus has come to save us from the wrath of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, four chapters later. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, which is another, uh, another word for the rapture, so comes as a thief in the night. Now let me just add here, this day comes to a th as a thief in the night to unbelievers, not to believers. And I'll show you, show you this in just a minute. The rapture is not gonna come and catch us by surprise as believers. It's only the unbelievers that are caught by surprise. Now I'll show you. For they say, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. So that day, so this day, and notice it's capitalized. It's a special day. It's, a, it's the rapture. So uh, that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God, look, look at this. For God did not appoint us to wrath but to obtain sal the hope of salvation, but, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify, which means to lift up, comfort each other and edify one another just as also you are doing. All right, I'm gonna take two shots at comforting you, all right? Two shots, give me, give me two shots at, all right, here's my first shot. My first shot is, um, the tribulation is the wrath of God and you're gonna go through the tribulation and you're gonna be treated horribly and you're gonna be beaten and tortured and killed. All right, how many of you are comforted by that? You feel comforted? <laughs> yeah, all right. All right, so, all right, well, give me another shot. Let me give you this shot. All right, the tribulation is the wrath of God. God has not appointed you to wrath. So before the wrath starts being poured out, he's going to come and get you and take you home with him to the joys of heaven so you won't have to go through the wrath. All right, are you comforted by that? Much better, right. It is preposterous, <laughs> to use a big word, it is preposterous to think that we could comfort anybody by telling them that they're gonna to have to go through the tribulation. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Listen to this, Luke 21. Jesus talking again. This, is, this right here is good. This, is, this, is, this will give you a little, uh, you, you'll see something here. Luke 21. Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. And that day, notice it's capitalized, it's talking about the rapture, this special day, it's, a, it's capitalized. And that day come on you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare. 
And everybody, you, you guys know what a snare, right? An animal trap. Or, you know, catches the foot, pow, you know, pulls you up, jabs you. I mean, any kind, of, any kind of snare. It just catches you completely by surprise. It's just, it, it, it's completely devastating to you. All right, he says, all right, don't get out there and start partying and forget about the fact that I'm coming. Because I don't want this to catch you like a snare. Because everybody that's not ready, they're going to be, it's going to be like they get trapped, is what happens. And this day come upon you unexpectedly. Look at verse 35. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all of these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Notice he said, what are we supposed to pray? All right, we're supposed to pray that we would not endure, that we would escape all of these things that would come. Now, I don't think that you could get more inclusive than what Jesus said here. This is going to be on every nation, every people, all over. This is, this is true about, about everything that happens, every single action that happens. And so let's think about this a second. Let's think about when something happens and then, and then everybody is trapped. That's what he's talking about. He said, look, don't, don't get yourself trapped into something that is impossible to get out of by not being aware of what's going on and, and being stupid. Now, now, I'll show you what I'm talking about. All right, when, when Noah got on the boat, all right, Noah's building the ark, no rain, no nothing, you know, no water around, nothing happening, everybody walking by. I mean, he's building a ship, man. He's not building a, a little rowboat. This thing is gigantic. It's like an ocean liner. And he's building it, and, he, and, and the people walking by, wagging their head, you know, uh, sucking their teeth, uh, you know, just uh, any kind of insult that they can do to tell him how stupid they think he is. Well, when it starts raining, Noah gets in the boat, and he pulls the door closed. When he pulled that door closed, the earth was trapped. Nobody else was getting on there. You were going to die. You were trapped. The snare got pulled and you got left behind because you didn't pay attention. In Lot's day, in Lot, an angel came and spoke to Lot and said, God's going to burn this place up. But he can't burn it up until you and your family get out of here and even get to the place where you're going. So hit the road, Jack. And when Lot walked through the gate of the city of Sodom, his wife looked back, turned into a pillar of salt, but Lot didn't look back. He kept walking. <laughs> and, and as soon as the gate of Sodom closed and Lot was on the outside, Sodom and Gomorrah were trapped. They were going to die. That snare closed on them, and now they're not getting out. They're not going to escape, and the event is going to happen to them even though they don't want it. Fire and brimstone are going to rain down from heaven. All right, when the rapture happens, it's going to happen how fast, Atomos, in a time that's too short to measure, in a time that's indivisible. Of course, we can divide an atom now, but they couldn't back in those days. Well, big, big things happen when you do it. You know? <laughs> but but that, that's how quick it's going to happen. And when, it, and, and when that rapture happens in the twinkling of an eye, the whole earth that is left it is what? Trapped. Nowhere for them to go. They're gone. That's what Jesus is saying. Realize that there are traps out there that will leave you with no return. And once it happens, you're trapped and it's over with. So Jesus said, but you, talking to us, but you guys, you, you pray that you may be counted worthy 
who escape, which is ek fuo, which means to, to, uh, uh, to leave a place, uh, to, to get out of a place, to escape. Pray that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man. Why would Jesus tell us to pray to escape if we couldn't escape? If we had to, if we, if we must go through the tribulation, if, if we, we must uh, go through all of this stuff and all this horrible stuff that's going to happen on this earth, wouldn't it be cruel of Jesus to tell us to pray for something that could never happen? Do you think Jesus, knowing the character of Jesus, would tell us, I'm telling you to pray for something that, you, that can never happen to you? That would be ludicrous. So Jesus is telling us, look, you're going to escape the last seven years on this earth that we call the tribulation. If you're a believer, I'm telling, Jesus said, I'm telling you, if you're a believer, you're going to escape this horrible last seven years of terrible time. And to me, that's encouraging. Now, I have a, a, another theology, but I'm going to just let that go because I don't have time for all that. You're going to have to skip over about two or three or four scriptures, Tanya. Let me get to this third question. This third question is, will children go in the rapture? Um, the answer is yes, I believe so. Let me, let me just say this to you. When I'm preaching on the word and the scripture, I'm, I'm real confident. I know y'all have noticed that. I'm really confident about the word and, and the fact of what it says and, and so forth. Now, not that I can't be wrong, but, I, I, but I, I don't believe I'm wrong and I'm confident about the fact that I know what I'm talking about. But when we get to areas where the scripture doesn't really tell us anything about it, I, I'm gonna just be sharing my opinion. And I'm gonna tell you that, I, I've tried to tell you that, this is my opinion. You know, I've said things before like, all right, when you get to heaven, don't tell Jesus this. You know, just, just let it go because I obviously wasn't right about it. But, but I do, but I believe because of the character of God, because of the nature of God, I believe that all children under the age of accountability, if the rapture happened, they would immediately go. As a matter of fact, I believe that all children go to heaven regardless if they're under the age of accountability. All those abortions, you know how many abortions we've had since 1973, Roe versus Wade, in this country? Over 60 million. Over 60 million. I believe every one of those babies are in heaven. People have miscarriages, I believe they're in heaven. Accidents happen, little kids die, SIDS, all that kind of stuff. Accidents, terrible things. I believe that every single one of their souls go immediately to heaven. And I believe we'll see them one day. Now, they won't look like they did when they left here because it wouldn't be heaven if you stayed an infant for eternity, would it? I mean, an infant can't experience itself. It can't understand things. It can't walk. It can't do anything. So that wouldn't be heaven for somebody to stay an infant their entire life. What's going to happen, I believe, is that God himself is going to be their father, and he's going, to, he's going to rear them. He's going to raise them around the throne of God himself. And when you get to heaven, you're going to get to see them, but they're going to be full grown. They're going to be, they're going to be just like you, and you're going to recognize them, and they're going to recognize you, and they're, but they're going to be full grown before God, raised by God in heaven. Now, you might say, what is the age of accountability? Well, for most people, people's thoughts, the age of accountability. Now, this happened centuries ago by the, Greek, by the, by the Jews. It's not a biblical thing. It, it's not in the Bible that this happens. It's just something they came up with, and it seems to fit, and the, the world kind of carried on with it. Uh, when boys get 13, they have a bar mitzvah, which means they've come of age. When girls get 12, now this is an Orthodox Judaism, when a girl gets 12, she gets bat mitzvahed, which bat means girl, bar means boy. So she gets bat mitzvahed at 12, uh, a little, little earlier. All right, so for most people, that's what we have accepted pretty much as an age in which children become accountable for their own relationships 
and their own decisions in life. Of course, all of you the parents have children and you know how it is. Some of them mature much faster than that. Some of them slower. I believe, all the, I, I believe every person on earth that never develops the ability to know right from wrong, good from bad, or to make a choice like that, they have some kind of mental issue going on or, or something's happened with their genetics or whatever it might be, they're all there too. It's just not God's nature to, to punish the innocent and people who couldn't even have an opportunity to make a right decision. Jesus went to the temple. This is the only scriptural passage. Well, two passages. David, the, the, the child that he and Bathsheba had, died after seven days. And, and David said to her, uh, look, we can't bring him back to us, but we can go to him. That's, that, that's in the scripture. So David was implying that that child's in heaven and we can go to, when we go to heaven, we're gonna see that child, King David. The only other passage about children uh, that are specific about something like this would be Jesus, when he was 12 years old, he went to the temple. He, he went with his family to the temple and his family got ready and left and he stayed at the temple and was, we're talking to all the uh, theologians down there about all kinds of theology and stuff like that. And they get about halfway back home and they miss him. They say, where in the world is Jesus? You know, I, they probably thought he was, they probably had an aunt back there, uncle or something. He, probably, he ride with Uncle John or whatever, you know. And then they all gather up somewhere and everybody says, hey, I thought Jesus was with, with you. No, I, I hadn't seen him all day. What? Well, did he get, well, he didn't get on his wagon with that friend. Uh, I mean, you know how they do. And then they come to the conclusion, uh-oh, we got to go back. So they go back to the temple and Mary is hot about it and, and, and basically gets on him. You made us so nervous. What in the world were you thinking about, son? You get it. And he looks at her very calmly and says, well, don't you know I need to be about my father's business? In other words, Jesus is telling her, well, I, aren't I old enough to get started on this mission that God sent me on? I'm 12 years old. I mean, that's, I'm old enough to make choices and so forth, so I, I'm, I'm ready to get, get going with this ministry, which shows you Jesus did not know when he was supposed to start his ministry. You know why he didn't know? Because it wasn't left up to him. He was under the authority of his mama and his daddy. God would tell them when it was time for him to start. But, so Mary looked at Jesus, and she said, you better get in that wagon. And he went and got in the wagon, and the Bible says, and he went home, and he was subject to his parents, and he grew in nurture and stature of the Lord. And then one day, when he was 30 years old, he got invited to a, to a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and his mama said, hey, ask him if I can come with you. Hey, can mama come? Yeah, okay, bring her. Yeah. So mama goes to the wedding with him, and they run out of wine. Big faux pas back then, big problem. Embarrassment, bad. And Mary calls Jesus over there and she says, all right, son, it's time for you to make them some wine. And he says, what, that, that, what does that have to do with me, woman? You know, <laughs> she said, you better get that wine. And she looked at the servants and she said, whatever he tells you, do it. You know what she was saying to him? All right, it's time to start doing miracles. It's time for you to start your ministry right now. Here's where you start right now. This is going to be the start of your ministry. And that was the first miracle that Jesus did, and that kicked off the ministry of his last three years of life. Children. I believe they're there, and I believe God takes them there. So, wouldn't it, I mean, imagine if, if, if the Lord came up to you and said, I got some great news for you. You are going to heaven in the rapture. Wow, that's great. What about my children? Um, well, <laughs> I hate to tell you, but you know, you're gonna have to leave them down here. What would you as a parent say then? You'd say, well, if they have to stay, then I'm gonna stay, wouldn't you? I don't know a parent that wouldn't say that. Their little kids, two years old, four years old, six years old, eight year old little kid. Well, they're going to have to stay down here and be tortured by the beast and the antichrist and the false prophet. You say, no, uh, I, I'm going to have to stay. I mean, I appreciate the opportunity to go and I know I'm going to have to live through the tribulation, but I can't leave my kids behind like that now. That's what we would say, right? 
See, the, I, Jesus would never, that would never be in the nature of God to do anything like that's ridiculous. So children go and, um, and, and, and they're there. Let me just mention this last thing to you and I probably will, come, will preach someday on this a good bit, but I, it's time to go and, and I, won't, I don't wanna just come back next week and get this one little deal here at the end. All right, when will the rapture happen is the fourth question. It's gonna happen tomorrow. Uh, not, not really, I just wanna see if you're paying attention. I saw some of you fade and I just wanna see if you're paying attention. All right, is there anything in the Bible that gives us any indications as to when it might be? Like what season would it be in? Well, yes, there is, as a matter of fact. And this is really phenomenal. Now, I'm not gonna teach you all about it because it would take years. I just want, to, I want you to see it. I want you to see the pattern of it. Israel is the only country in the world that has its holidays given to it by God. In Leviticus chapter 23, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the feast... Now, when we see that word feast, we usually think of a big meal, like a big family reunion meal, but that's not what feast. Feast is the Greek word moed, and moed means an appointed festival. So don't think, okay, food and dinner. No, it means an, an appointed festival. So speak to the children of Israel and, and say to them, the appointed festivals of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. All right, convocations comes from the word, from the Greek word, mikre, kind of like macres, but not quite. Mikre, and mikre means, means a dress rehearsal. So what is the Lord saying here? The Lord's saying, all right, I'm, 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 these holy days, these feast days that I'm giving you right now, which Leviticus 23 gives you all of them and it tells you about them and what you do on them, what you can't do on them and all that. Read it if you want to, it's easy to understand. And he said, now, what these are, these are, these are festival days and they are days that are gonna be a dress rehearsal of things that are gonna happen in the future. That's what the feast days are. There are seven of them and they had to be done within the first seven months of the year. Three of them, basically four, happen in the springtime. Three happen in the fall with a big long summer in between. All right, the first one happens on the 10th day of the first month of the Jewish calendar, and it is the Feast of Passover. Passover is when you take the lamb and you spill its blood and you put it on the doorpost of your house so that the death angel will pass over. This happened in, in Egypt, you remember. So it is the death of the lamb, the blood of the innocent to cover the guilty is what Passover is all about. And so oh, Passover is the first feast of every year. That's why, that's why Easter is always messed up in its timing because the Jews have a lunar calendar and we have a solar calendar. And, and Passover, I mean, and, and Easter is, is set up with these first three feasts. The next day after Passover uh, is the feast, starts the Feast of Unleavened. Well, actually, Unleavened Bread starts with Passover. So Passover is part of Unleavened Bread. Unleavened Bread, leaven is considered sin. It's representative of sin. So for seven days in this Feast of Unleavened Bread, they could not, the Jews could not have any leaven, any yeast in their house. The children played a game, hide and seek, hide and seek in the yeast, you know. And, they, and, and that's why we, when we have communion, we have those little flat pieces of nasty tasting bread. That, right, because it doesn't have any leaven in it. There's no yeast to make it rise. It's just these little flat, chippy things. All right, so that's, that's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So you have Passover, Unleavened Bread. The, the, the first day of the week following Passover is the, fe the Feast of First Fruits. First Fruits is where Israel takes the barley harvest that has been growing in the winter over there, by the way, and it's ripe in the spring, and they take it, it's barley that's gonna say, I mean, this is their crop. This is, this is one of their big money crops, one of their big stable food crops, barley. And they take it, and they, and they offer before the Lord, and they thank God for his blessings and his growth and all that. These are the first fruits of this harvest. And we're thanking you and blessing you for all of that. 
50 days after first fruits comes the feast of harvest, which is another feast where they wave uh, things before the Lord. This time they take two loaves of bread that, are, that have yeast in them. They wave them before the Lord, thanking the Lord for all of the, 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 the harvest of the, of the summer. It's, the name of the feast is also called Pentecost. Pentecost means 50, so 50 days. So 50 days after first fruits comes Pentecost, where two leavened pieces of uh, bread are, wo- are, are waved before the Lord, representing the Jews and the Gentiles, representing the church, being combined, so forth. Anyway, that's what it ended up being. But, but, that's, but, but that's Pentecost. All right, then you have this big, long summer, nothing happens, long time. Then in the seventh month of the year, the last three feasts happen. The first one is the Feast of Trumpets, the, at the Feast of Trumpets, it, it's, it's a festival to, uh, where there's another offering and they have uh, ceremonies and, and, and they have nine separate meetings. And in those nine meetings, 11 trumpets play in each meeting. So that's 11 times nine. How many is that? 99. And then at the end of the, at the, end of the two days, this is a two-day festival, the last trumpet blows. It's the hundredth trumpet. And it blows louder and longer than in all the rest of the trumpets. And then the, about four or five days later comes atonement, the day of atonement. And then about, and that's the day where, you know, where they had to go, where the high priest went in, into the Holy of Holies and took the sins and confessed the sins and to cover the sins for everybody until the next year. They didn't get them relieved. They just got them covered for the next year. And all of them had to come down there and bring their offerings, confess and everything. If they didn't, they'd be kicked out of Israel and they'd die in the desert because you can't live out there by yourself. Big deal. About 10 days later comes the last feast, feast of the year. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles lasts seven days. So you have the Feast, the, the, the feast of Tabernacle is the seventh feast and the seventh month, and it lasts seven days. Seven, seven, seven. And seven's the number of perfection, obviously. The number of completion. So this is a real good thing. Tabernacles is when they get, when the, when, when the Jews got out, they went out into their yards or into the city and they, and they pitched tents and they lived in those tents for seven days like they did in the desert when they were, God delivered them from Egypt. This was to uh, praise him and, and to look at hope for his return and his deliverance and so forth, his presence actually. All right, now I'm just gonna, that, those are the seven feasts. Now, and I'm just going to suffice it to say to you right now today, and then we'll quit. When Jesus was on the earth the first time, he fulfilled four of those feasts perfectly and exactly. Uh, he was crucified on Passover. He was put in a tomb on unleavened bread. He was raised on first fruits. And the Holy Spirit came down and anointed everybody, all the disciples in that upper room in Jerusalem and 3,000 souls got saved that day. Everything that happened to Jesus when he was here on earth happened according to these feast days. To the, to the day. So the speculation would be that when he comes again, that what happens on this earth and what happens with us, what, what, what remains in the prophetic calendar will happen on these feast days. If he fulfilled the first four perfectly, why would, he, why would we not think the last three would be fulfilled perfectly? So the next feast is the Feast of Trumpets. And of course, trumpets are associated with every passage of scripture concerning the rapture and the end and everything. Uh, the last trump of God shall sound, the trump of God shall sound, the dead Christ will rise first, all that kind of stuff. So the, the, fe- the feast of trumpets is most likely the day. That's when I expect Jesus to come. Now, it might, I'm, I'm not saying it's gonna be this year, but I think when he comes, it's gonna be on the feast of trumpets. It, it, it just would have to be. And then atonement happens when Jesus sets his feet on the Mount of Olives 
and splits and then he defeats all the enemies that are coming against Israel and then they're going to turn to him and they're going to trust him and be saved and cry and weep and, and, and he's going to forgive them and redeem them right there. So the church is not going to have to be atoned for because we've already been atoned for. Jesus' blood has already atoned us. So that's not for us, that's for them. And they're going to be atoned and then we're going to go and live forever with the Lord and that's tabernacles. We're going to tabernacle with him forever. So anyway, that's just a brief discussion. So whatever year the rapture may happen, I believe it's going to happen on the Feast of Trumpets. I, let me just say this. It doesn't have to, but I would be surprised if it didn't. That's just what I'm saying. Because it's just, it's just really indicative to, for that. I mean, those days are given. Things happen on those days. It's already been fulfilled. I mean, these are, you know, remember, these are prophetic dress rehearsals for what will happen in the future. That's what God said in Leviticus 23. He said these are, these are special days that are prophetic dress rehearsals for what's going to happen in the future. So anyway, there you go. That's a little thoughts about the rapture and so forth and all of the things that would be. So don't go out of here all, you know, nervous or something. I mean, September the 6th through the 8th, I think, is trumpets this year. So you just got a few months to get right. <laughs> it's a two-day feast, so, you know, I don't know whether it'll be at the beginning or the end, so you better get ready. But anyway, anyway, uh, it might be this year. It might be 10 years. Who knows? I don't know. But don't go out and get all nervous and worried. Uh, just know that God's got it under control. And, and, and before anything terrible happens, you're going to be gone. Uh, I don't know. We may get to see a few little uh, wrinkles. I mean, right now, what we're watching right now, tell me the last two weeks that you hadn't been watching a horror show. I mean, could it be any worse than that? I mean, it's hard to imagine. And this is his first two weeks. So I'm just saying that uh, this is preparation. I mean, you didn't think that one night you would go to sleep and the world would be fine and the next day you open your eyes, the Antichrist would be on the throne, the world would be controlled by him, people would have marks in their heads and on their foreheads. I mean, you didn't think it was gonna happen like that, right? You know there has to be some transition. Things have to start transitioning and I believe that's where we are. We're in transition. Moving fast too, pretty fast. All right, all right, let's bow our heads. 